Uh, welcome to all of you here in Kirksville, uh, those of you in Mesa, and um, we have uh, live streaming going on as well. Uh, I do appreciate all of the students who are here uh, with their sack lunches, taking everything out of their sack before uh, we get started with our presentation, but we're delighted to have all of you here. Um, Dr. Eldon Wardenave, my um, uh, counterpart out on the Mesa campus with the Interprofessional and Aging Studies Project. Um, both of us um, are very engaged with both uh, aging studies and um, making life better for elders, uh, as well as interprofessional uh, activities uh, for students and uh, engaging with uh, patients as part of the interprofessional activities. So we're delighted to welcome you to this annual event. Um, a quick procedural note, we'll entertain questions uh, at the end of the presentation, so we will try to stop a few minutes before um, uh, 12.50, um, and our speaker will um, field those questions for us. Um, the, um, those who are on live stream, you can submit your questions via chat. Uh, we'll have microphones here and in Mesa for questions from the floor. Um, we do want to allow as much time as possible for our speaker. We have a tight time frame with academic schedules, and so um, we have provided the print material, the little program that has information on our speaker, uh, but as well um, on um, an individual who was very, very uh, important to the initiation of the Aging Studies Project. Um, and some of our uh, a real champion for our interprofessional activities. Dr. Michael Creedon uh, was um, a gerontologist uh, who was part of the ATSU family, uh, both in the uh, College of um, Graduate Health Sciences as well as KCOM and the uh, University Aging Project. Um, your uh, program has a lot of information about his life, um, and we were delighted this year to have a speaker who was a colleague and friend of Dr. Creedence, uh, who is our presenter for this year's present for this year's lecture. So, uh, without any further ado, it's my uh, pleasure to present Kathy Cameron, who is the uh, senior director for the Center on uh, Healthy Aging at the National Council on Aging. So, Kathy, I'm going to turn it over Thank to you. you. Well, great. Good afternoon, everyone here, and good morning to those of you at the Mesa campus. Thank you for joining us so early in the morning, and um, happy Friday. Um, unfortunately, it is Friday the 13th, right, but we won't, we won't talk about that. Um, so it's really my pleasure to deliver the AT Still lecture on aging today. Um, as Janet mentioned, Michael Creedon was a friend of mine and a collaborator collaborator in gerontology. Um, he was, he had a very warm, open personality, he was very entrepreneurial, had amazing insights, and a really a positive attitude about older adults, um, older Americans. Um, he always had a wonderful story to share, and those of you who knew him knew he had a, a beautiful Irish accent. Um, so it's really a privilege for me to have known him and an honor to be able to give the 14th annual lecture on aging today um, in his name. So the focus of my presentation is emerging issues in community integrated healthcare for seniors. So I'm gonna be kind of presenting a little bit of view from Washington DC, because that's where I hail from. Um, and I think you all recognize that healthcare really is undergoing um, rapid transformation and developments in 2018 should prove um, no different. Um, and much has happened already this year with the passage of the, um, the, the Budget Act um, a few weeks ago that did include some health-related um, initiatives. So, and I think we all need to stay on top of trends um, that are sweeping the healthcare community. Um, that includes things like new payment structures, cost pressures, system integration, and these are among some of the trends. Um, and there's also a lot of technological advances, clinical advances, and they're really gonna be drivers of healthcare transformation over the next several years. Um, another really important trend 
um, that we're seeing is a much greater recognition of the social determinants of health. Um, they're really getting much more attention. And I see this um, on a national level through attendance at a variety of different conferences um, that are put on by groups like um, AHIP, which represents all of the major health plans. That has been a theme throughout their conferences over the, the last year or so. And that, that's going to continue to be so. So, which is, I think, a good sign. We just need to make sure that um, they put the money where their mouth is um, and really pay for some of these social determinants of health that I'll be talking about um, today during my presentation. So to begin, I'd like to share a bit about the organization where I am based, which is the National Council on Aging, or NCOA. And we're located in Arlington, Virginia, right outside of Washington, D.C. And we're one of the oldest national organizations dedicated to improving the lives of older adults. And we were founded in 1950 in response to lots of changes in health care that were taking place at the time, including the rise in cost of health care for a lot of seniors. That was pre-Medicare, and seniors were really struggling with their health care. So NCOA was trying to address some of those issues, as well as concerns about mandatory require, uh, retirement that um, was kind of bubbling up. And NCOA has evolved significantly over the years, but really continues to champion important issues and innovative programs that reflect our core values to make life better for all older adults, um, especially those who are struggling, um, those who are low income, those living in rural areas. Um, and we are the national voice for every American's right to age well. And our vision is a just and caring society in which um, each of us, as we age, lives with dignity, purpose, and security. I think all of us want to live with that. And we believe that every American deserves to age with their best possible health and economic security. And those are kind of the two pillars of our organization, the Center for Healthy Aging and the Center for Benefits Access that focuses on economic security. And we really try to empower individuals with trusted, proven solutions to improve their their daily lives. And another major activity and focus of NCOA is protecting and strengthening uh, federal programs such as Medicare, Medicaid, and the Older Americans Act. These are the really the three primary programs in addition to Social Security that older adults depend on as they age. So as you can imagine, our public policy staff has been quite active over the last several years um, with threats to the Affordable Care Act, um, as you all know, threats to, to Medicare, major changes in Medicare have been discussed and continue to be discussed. And there have also been a number of proposed cuts to the Older Americans Act. And certainly feel that this level of activity um, is not going to change anytime soon. So we do our work by identifying challenges facing older adults. We develop creative solutions, as I mentioned. And we try to bring these solutions to scale to improve millions of lives. And some of the programs that we've created or worked on over the years, some that you may have heard of, programs like the Foster Grandparents Program. Um, we help to develop and evaluate the Meals on Wheels Program um, a couple decades ago. Um, one of our current programs is called the Benefits Checkup, and it's a, a program that helps um, older adults get access to needed federal, state, and local benefits. So it could be things like appropriate Medicare Part D plans, or it could be um, you know, local heating assistance or rent assistance or SNAP, which is uh, formerly known as uh, food stamps, which so many older adults need access to, but unfortunately, they don't even know that they are eligible for the program. So, and as we know, proper nutrition is really key to the health of older adults. Um, we've also developed My Medicare Matters, which is an online program that helps people choose um, the Medicare plans. We've developed the Aging Mastery Program, which is a 10-week community-based program. It's an educational program to really help people think about what they want to do during their retirement years. Um, it really kind of empowers them and engages them in activities that um, they want to focus on in their, their later years. Um, and then most of the work that I do um, is about evidence-based health promotion and disease prevention programs and community settings. 
And I'll be talking about some of these programs uh, throughout my presentation. So I direct two national resource centers that are funded by the Administration for Community Living. One focusing on the chronic disease self-management suite of programs, and I'll um, discuss those a little bit later, and falls prevention programs. And we also work on other important issues like behavioral health, uh, physical activity, immunizations, oral health. And currently, too, we're trying to better address the opioid epidemic among older adults. They have not been immune to this problem, as many of you know. Um, and we're trying to work with older adults and prevent um, opioid uh, misuse and abuse issues and try to better manage their chronic pain. And these are the types of technical assistance activities that, that we provide to community-based organizations across the country um, who are implementing these evidence-based um, programs. So we hold um, annual meetings. We do one-on-one -on -one support. We do a lot of networking among community-based organizations. And when I say community-based organizations, I'm talking about those that serve older adults, like senior centers, um, area agencies on aging. could be faith-based organizations that serve older adults. Um, and YMCAs even are, are doing more and more to serve um, the needs of the older adult population. We have a lot of online tools and resources. We share best practices. And we also work with um, state grantees that have received funding to implement these programs. And we manage the national databases for, um, for these grantees. And really, the ultimate goal of the technical assistance and support that we provide is to help these community-based organizations achieve an integrated, sustainable, evidence-based program network. Um, so much of our focus is on how we can better integrate these programs with healthcare entities, so how they can work with hospital systems, um, managed care organizations, Medicare Advantage plans, Medicaid programs, and so on. Because these are all programs that have been shown to improve health outcomes and reduce healthcare costs, and I'll be saying a, a bit more about that. So um, I just wanted to touch upon some of the, the trends and emerging issues, kind of as background. Um, these are the, the major issues that we're concerned about or uh, most focused on, and they're all sort of interrelated, and they all relate to how the healthcare system is being transformed. Um, the payment models continue to shift to value. So we're moving from a payment system for each individual service to one that focuses on, on value, on the actual outcomes of those services. So instead of getting paid for each for the volume of services that you provide as healthcare professionals, um, you're going to have to start collecting data on the impact of your services and show that they're making a difference. And those outcomes will be tied to, to your payments. Um, and that, so there's a lot of, right now, a lot of measures that are being collected around hospital acquired conditions. Um, you've probably heard about the, um, the hospital uh, readmission reduction program. Um, there's also measures around patient satisfaction and experience and quality indicators like the star ratings for Medicare Advantage plans. So, and this movement is just going to continue to grow as the, um, the healthcare system evolves. And then I don't know if any of you have heard of the MACRA or the Medicare Access and CHIP Reauthorization Act, but that again is a, a value-based system. Um, that's going to have a significant impact on uh, physicians' practice. And the bottom line is that, you know, physician payment will increasingly be dependent upon quality indicators, as I said, patient experience, um, use of uh, electronic health records. So it's great that you probably all are pretty technologically <laughs> inept, or not inept, but very talented. So inept, that's, that's my generation. Um, so having that experience with technology is really going to help you um, in your own practice. Um, and of course, as always, the pressure to reduce costs, and that really you know, has been going on for years, but a greater focus with the Affordable Care Act and trying to accomplish the, the triple aim of, of better health, uh, better quality, and improved um, health care outcomes and lower costs. So we're also seeing a lot of changes in terms of um, healthcare integration, consolidation, and mergers. And um, 
I don't know if you've heard about CVS and Aetna. So that's, that's a major proposed consolidation. Um, it would be a $69 billion merger between CVS Health, um, which operates over a thousand minute clinics across the country. Um, and they want to buy Aetna, which is one of our country's um, largest health insurance companies. Um, and it would really expand the consumer base for both Aetna and CVS, so that's kind of why they're interested in, in, in merging. And part of this, too, is in response to um, one of the rivals of Aetna, and that's United Health Group, which operates one of the country's largest um, urgent care um, Medical Express, um, you know, these sort of minute clinics or um, driving clinics in some cases. So, I mean, that's going to be growing more and more, too, these, these clinics where people can go to to get their health care issues and problems addressed. Um, similarly, um, one of the latest mergers announced was uh, between Walmart and Humana. Humana is another very large insurer offering Medicare Advantage plans to older adults. It's one of the largest um, Medicare Advantage uh, providers to older adults across the country. Um, and their talks are still in the early stages, but one of the potential partnerships being discussed would bring, um, would center on using Walmart stores and expanding its in-store clinics um, for one-stop medical care. So a lot of what's happening too in, in healthcare transformation is around convenience. So a lot of older adults, they could go there for their medical care, get their prescriptions, get their diabetes and their high blood pressure monitored. Um, so it does have some advantages for, for many older adults. And you know, Walmarts too are in a lot of rural areas. So where access is a problem, this may help address that. You know, it's too soon to tell um, and whether or not that merger will even, will even happen. Um, and I know in many rural areas too, we have more of a fee-for-service model. So if Humana moves into Walmarts, then I think we'll see more Medicare Advantage plans being offered to older adults in rural areas. So and you've probably heard of the Amazon, J.P. Morgan, and Berkshire Hathaway, that they're looking to also join forces to develop their own strategy uh, for their employees. And they've done this because they've expressed frustration, dissatisfaction with the current healthcare system. So that may affect, you know, if it does go through, if they do kind of join forces and develop some type of healthcare system, um, that could affect those living in this area because Berkshire Hathaway, right, owns Kraft and Heinz, so those employees may be affected by, by that type of, of merger. So, um, so there's a lot going on, and a big piece of this, too, is all the data that could be mined by, by these mergers um, that could drive people and drive outcomes more appropriately. So also there's been a huge growth of analytical tools um, I'm certainly sure that you know that um, electronic medical records are being used all across the country, but there are other tools that are being used in, in healthcare systems. Um, even artificial intelligence, and then this whole internet of things where digital technologies are being connected and they share information. That's another, I think, huge growth area. And then, I don't know if you've heard about Apple looking at um, working with 13 different healthcare systems, including Johns Hopkins and the University of Pennsylvania, to create sort of um, a, a place where patients, consumers can go and have all their health data in one place. You can go on your, your iPhone and, and get your, your healthcare data. You can share it with all of your healthcare providers. Um, I mean, theoretically, this would be great for older adults because they see multiple uh, physicians typically for multiple chronic conditions, they have multiple medications. It would be a great way to share data more effectively across, across various healthcare providers. So this, again, is in the very early planning stages. Um, but, you know, it's interesting because um, I just started with a new vet for my two cats. They already have this in place for veterinary care. <laughs> so. It definitely is going to be on the horizon. So, and hopefully, we'll make your job easier too, as you work. We just need to make sure we protect this data that will be available um, online. So, let's see. So, other other trends: care everywhere. You know, with the explosion of 
mobile technology, um, applications for home and self-monitoring, and not to mention the expansion of the standalone clinics that I talked about, the urgent care clinics, and retail care clinics in places like CVS and Walmart. Um, we're really going to see um, evolving healthcare models with care provided everywhere. So it opens up opportunities for physicians to work in a variety of different, in a, different settings. And then certainly telemedicine, too, is going to provide um, care much more broadly as we kind of expand the use of telemedicine. So that, that's another major change on the horizon. Um, and the consumer experience, I think as health plans and others compete for members, it's all going to be about the consumer experience. Um, but you know, plans need to really address what is most important for, for patients and have a much more patient-focused approach. Um, there are a lot of clinical advances coming down the pike, um, you know, everything from precision medicine, um, looking at um, genetic profiles of patients and really being very precise about um, the type of treatments that are provided. Um, you know, there's even talk of 3D printers to replace organs and tissues. Um, robotics are being used not just in the operating room, but you know, robotics as companions for older adults, for example, um, or you know, for interacting with patients and monitoring patients. Um, and as I mentioned, mobile technology is just going to continue to grow. Um, workforce is, to me, one of the major issues that we're confronted with with our healthcare system, uh, particularly for the older adult population. Um, we don't have enough um, physicians, nurses, pharmacists, social workers who are trained um, in geriatrics. We have 10,000 people turning 65 every day, and we uh, the workforce is solely inadequate to meet that that need. And I think too, um, I don't know how it is around here, but um, in nursing homes, home health, we have a lot of immigrants who are working in those settings and with changing immigration policy, I worry that that's going to even make the, the issue a lot worse with meeting the, the needs for, for older adults. So lastly, greater attention to um, the social determinants of health. So I'd like to spend the rest of my time talking about that and, and why social determinants of health. Well. As we say um, at NCOA, it's not so much your genetic code, um, but your zip code that determines your health. And there's been a lot of research looking at that specifically. So, and this really shows you that you know our health is dependent on 30% genetics, 10% in the healthcare setting, in the physician's office, in the hospital. Um, but the rest is all around individual behaviors. So the level of physical activity that we engage in the nutrition, um, you know, the food that we eat on a daily basis, um, other habits like smoking and drinking, um, substance use, those things. 40% of that impacts our health. And then it, the others are the societal and environmental factors, um, particularly for low-income um, individuals. So, so we need to address, you know, not only the healthcare needs, the specific needs that can be be provided in healthcare settings, but the societal, environmental, and behavioral aspects. And that's really what we're trying to focus on at, at NCOA. Um, to create a healthcare system um, that's not just about sick care, that it's really about helping people to be as healthy as possible. And these are the primary social determinants of health. This is the definition. It's the structural determinants and conditions in which people are born, grow, live, work, and age. So it's, um, it's our economics. It's making sure that people have a living wage, um, that they have enough to pay for their food, uh, for their electricity, for their heating, for their air conditioning if they need it. Um, um, so think about you know someone's discharged from the hospital and uh, maybe they're newly diabetic and are put on insulin, um, ensuring that they actually have a refrigerator that's working. Hopefully their you know, electricity hasn't been turned off while they were in the hospital. So those very basic needs are what we're talking about here. Um, health education is key um, in the social determinants of health. The physical environment, the housing, you know, what is their living situation like and how does that impact um, their health? 
Um, you know, are there 10 other people living in the house? Um, you know, do they have AC when they need it? Uh, particularly those, for example, with asthma. Um, employment, again, related to um, economic security. What is their social support network like? And what is their overall access to health care? So these are all really important aspects in delivering health to, to all individuals. And um, like I said, I think there's you know, a huge movement to, to start paying for some of these things within our healthcare system. Um, and just to show you how we kind of stack up against other countries and paying for some of these social services. So we actually only pay 9% um, of GDP goes into paying for all of these social services. So look at, look at how that compares to other countries, France, as high as 21%. Um, and just have, unfortunately it doesn't have, this particular slide um, doesn't have the um, life expectancy. But all of these other countries that invest more in social care have a much higher life expectancy than the US. Um, the US is currently 79. All of these other countries are about 82. So, so it does make a, make a difference if you're looking at you know, a real indicator. Um, and yet we devote a greater percent of our GDP to health. Um, so if we can kind of shift some of that spending to social services, I think we can make a difference. So these are the, the areas that we are focusing on um, primarily at the National Council on Aging. And um, the, the column on the far right is the work that I do around the evidence-based programs which address many of these behaviors that impact health, healthy eating, physical activity, depression, sleep, um, injury prevention so through some of the work we do around falls prevention, and then um, reducing substance misuse and abuse. So how do we um, you know, ensure that older adults in particular have access to the needed social services um, that they need to maintain their health or improve their health? Um, we work very closely with an organization called the um, National Association of Area Agencies on Aging. So they represent the community-based organizations that connect older adults to, to services in the community that are so vital to their health. And they did a survey last year to find out um, what are the most common healthcare partners that are engaged with not only area agencies on aging, but um, centers for independent living that serve um, adults with physical and intellectual disabilities um, and behavioral health needs. Um, where are partnerships already being formed um, through contracts? So it's already starting to evolve where these community-based organizations that are providing some of these social services are working with healthcare. And where we're seeing the most activity, where the most contracts are, um, are with um, Medicaid managed care organizations, um, hospitals or hospital systems. Um, the VA has started to embrace kind of social care for their veterans across all ages. Um, and Medicaid dual plans. Um, commercial health insurance too, um, and state Medicaid programs. So we're starting to see some growth. They're going to do this survey every year to kind of track the growth of these types of partnerships between healthcare entities and community-based organizations. Um, and these are the types of services that are being provided most commonly with these partnerships or contracts between community-based organizations and the, and the healthcare entities on the previous slide. So a lot of it focuses on um, Medicaid services around case management, care coordination, and service coordination. You know, it could be after someone's discharged from the hospital, they're referred to the local AAA, and the care coordination is paid for through Medicaid, for example. Or it could be a care transition, someone's getting discharged, say, from a nursing home um, to um, you know, a home care or home environment. And the CBO can help with that transition into the home and connect them with services that, that they need to live as independently as possible. Nutrition is another very common service that um, healthcare entities are interested in. So this could be something like Meals on Wheels. Um, 
Also person-centered planning, that's something that Centers for Independent Living um, do very well. So, um, and then at the bottom, oh, transportation is another very important service. Um, one of the major issues that older adults have is getting to healthcare appointments, um, getting blood work done, getting wh whatever it is that's needed to improve access. So transportation is um, something that we see community-based organizations providing to members of various health plans and healthcare systems. And you've probably heard, I don't know, you don't have Uber around here, but they have just formed a company called Uber Health and they are actually targeting health plans to help health plans get patients to appointments. So their business model is, we get your patients to your appointments, you don't have as many missed appointments. You know, overall you could have better healthcare outcomes as a result, so. And Lyft is doing the same thing, you know, they're the two, two major competitors, so. All right, so, so evidence-based programs that we work on, only about 19% of the community-based organizations that do have contracts, have those contracts to offer evidence-based programs. So we have a, a ways to go to get um, healthcare entities interested in some of these evidence-based programs. So let me say a few words about what these programs are. Have any, has anyone heard of the Chronic Disease Self-Management Education Program? No? Okay, well these programs were developed at Stanford University School of Medicine uh, over 20 years ago. And they are really patient engagement and activation programs. As physicians, don't you all wanna have activated patients to work with to be more adherent to the therapies that you prescribe, including the medication? So this is a program that helps do that. It's, um, it's a six week uh, workshop offered in community-based settings. Um, it's now being offered by some employers to people with chronic conditions like diabetes, arthritis, heart disease, hypertension. And it's co-facilitated by someone who's gone through the program and can kind of talk about the benefits of these programs. But it really engages and activates the participants to take much more control um, and responsibility for their health and it helps them better manage their symptoms. Um, we've seen improvements in the amount of time that people exercise as a result of these programs. Um, they set goals, they um, work on decision making around problems related to their health, and they develop action plans to address these problems. Um, so it really helps them overcome challenges that they may have. But I think that probably the, the secret ingredient to these programs is the support that the participants give to one another in the program and the sharing of strategies that they use to better manage their, their health care conditions. So. so this is the type of program that we, we promote across the country that's offered by some of these community-based organizations that I mentioned that we're trying to get healthcare entities to start to embrace and offer to their, uh, their members. And these programs have been shown to impact uh, the triple aim of healthcare, of better health, better care, and lower costs. So they've actually been shown to reduce emergency department uh, visits and hospitalizations. So we know these programs work. Um, the other broad area that we work on are uh, evidence-based falls prevention programs. And for those of you who do work with older adults, you recognize this is a very common, unfortunate problem among the older adult uh, population. About 27,000 older adults die from a fall every year, and we spend about $50 billion on the costs associated with falls. So the emergency department visits, the hospitalizations, the, the rehab, and so on, and about 75% of those costs are picked up by Medicare and Medicaid. So it has become um, kind of a, an area that the federal government's paying more attention to and putting a little bit of money um, towards through grants to, state or, to local and state organizations to implement evidence-based programs. Um, also the CDC has created a, it's called the Steady Toolkit, has anyone ever heard of that? Stopping elderly accidents, deaths, and injuries. So it actually takes some guidelines that were developed by the American Geriatric Society for reducing falls and puts it into a workable toolkit that physicians can 
use in their practice, kind of embed into their, their day-to-day practice. It includes an algorithm for screening, assessment, and intervention, um, and also provides recommendations on referral to some of these evidence-based programs or a PT or an OT as needed. And they're also working with a couple of EHR vendors to integrate the, um, the algorithm that's been developed into the electronic health record so it can be easily um, put into practice. So those are again are all ways in which the system is transforming. So these are the, the common um, evidence-based programs for false prevention that we help to promote. And I just want to um, make a shout out to AT Still University um, in Mesa because they've been offering a matter of balance now for 10 years and they offer like 80 workshops um, on a yearly basis. So they really reach a tremendous number of older adults. And this is a program that um, addresses the fear of falling, which many older adults have, where they may have fallen in the past or know someone who has fallen, and that limits their activity. So it's kind of a, a vicious circle where they limit their activities, um, their muscle strength declines, their balance declines, and that puts them at even higher risk for falls. It also puts them at higher risk for social isolation and depression. So, so we're trying to get these programs out and about um, in the community. Um, and I know also here at AT Still, this is a program that's offered locally. Um, and um, also AT Still in Mesa is working on a really um, cool idea, and that is looking at the impact that yoga has on preventing falls. So they're doing a study with tribal communities out there in Arizona to see um, if that can actually prevent falls. It's something that their seniors asked for. They wanted to, to do yoga, so let's see if it actually makes a difference in improving strength and balance um, for those. So, um, so this kind of summarizes why these programs are important. Um, patient activation ignites, or patient um, education ignites participant activation. Um, we get older adults and others to really help self-manage their chronic conditions, and that leads to more preventive health, better health status. And for health plans and healthcare providers, that can also improve some of their quality measures. So, um, you know, their HEDIS measures under the Medicare Advantage plan, and some of their um, consumer experience and consumer satisfaction measures. And we also believe that you know, plans are trying to retain members as much as they can. And these, this could be an added benefit that they can provide to their members. And by providing kind of above and beyond what traditional plans offer, that can help them retain members. So um, I know we're headed towards the end. I just wanted to mention um, you know, we have a lot of resources on our website about all the the things that I've talked about today around evidence-based programs, public policy, um, and also how healthcare and social care really can come together to improve the lives of older adults. So I welcome you know you to take a look at that um, and share with others. And this is a, another website that has a lot of great information for for the aging network. And a lot of this is helping the aging network really speak the language of healthcare because those in the aging network tend to be more from social work and gerontology and other fields and not so much healthcare. So there's a lot of great tools out there um, that I would, I don't know if we have, we have a few folks in the aging network here. But um, what we're seeing, um, you know, in terms of partnerships around evidence-based programs with community-based organizations are, are these types of entities. So federally qualified health centers, Medicare Advantage plans, waiver programs, geriatric wellness centers, um, quality improvement organizations. I don't know if there's one around here, but they're really focusing on diabetes prevention and management. So they've been a great partner for community-based organizations. And I wanted to mention um, just briefly uh, last month when the, the budget was passed for uh, fiscal year 2018, it also did include some health-related um, initiatives. And one of those is the Independence at Home. So that's been a demonstration project that um, 
has been in 14 different states for the last several years. And this Chronic Care Act, um, which stands for Creating High Quality Results and Outcomes Necessary to Improve Chronic Care, um, is going to expand that program. So there may be some additional funding to um, you know, maybe to implement that here in Missouri. But what it does is it really allows seniors with multiple complex um, and often expensive chronic health care conditions to receive specialized care at home. And it brings in a team of physicians, nurse practitioners, I think they have pharmacists on the team, who actually make house calls and better coordinate all of the care for these very high cost, high risk individuals. So, so that's a good thing. Uh, Medicare Advantage uh, plans have now been given more flexibility in how they can use the dollars that they get from, from the federal government under Medicare. So they now have flexibility to offer all those social care services that I've talked about. So it could be home delivered meals, rides to medical appointments, um, personal care aids to help with activities of daily living. And there are many other examples of uh, the types of services that they now can provide to their Medicare beneficiaries. In the past, they had to provide uniform services to all of their members, but now they can target services to particular um, population groups that they serve. So if they want to do some special services for those with diabetes or heart disease, they can now do that. Um, and really, you know, go beyond like, health care. So, so that, as we've been talking about, so um, this is just another slide of additional resources that I encourage you to take a look at about kind of what's happening in the community. And I know you're all sort of in the healthcare field, but I mean, one thing that I would recommend to all of you, wherever you practice, get to know the community that you work in. Really understand who these community-based organizations are that are also trying to impact the lives of older adults. Because as we know, only 10% of health is provided in healthcare settings. So if we can better address all of these social determinants of health um, you know, through collaborative practice with the broad array of service providers and communities, I think we can really improve the lives of older adults. So, is that a Just a real quick hand before we... As we transition uh, into our question and answer period, I do want to take a minute to introduce Debbie Blessing, who has worked really hard and coordinated most of 99% of the activities for uh, this event and some others that we've had in conjunction with Kathy's visit. And also, I don't know how many of our a AHEC staff and Aging Studies folks are in here, and I'm sorry I didn't say something earlier while they were here. Debbie, come on down. Uh, she's going to handle the Q&A session. Um, but at any rate, it takes a lot of people to put something like this on, and so really do appreciate their, the staff work and the folks out in Mesa. And with that, um, there are going to be questions from that end and questions from this end. Okay. Uh, Elton, do you have a question? You want to go ahead? I always have questions. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse Please, me, one. Very much. Elton, two seconds. Uh, sign in if you haven't and uh, evaluations, please make sure you do those as well at both ends there. All right. All right. We'll just take turns, Elton. Thank you, Ms. Cameron, for your kind words about our falls prevention efforts here at Mesa. I, I you're welcome. Curious, Congratulations. Thank you. Specifically, you know, you're talking about essentially uh, what we have discussed is a kind of an expansion of the continuum of care to include uh, community-based organization efforts in healthcare and having that be embraced by the system as healthcare. Exactly. Uh, one one of the real challenges we 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 confront is getting the healthcare system itself, not just the funders, but the healthcare system itself, to embrace those resources. Now, what do you have to say about that in terms of what you're seeing and and uh, what seems to be working or not working? Well, I think there are different strategies depending on your, who you're talking to within the healthcare system. So if you're talking to kind of the clinical staff, I think you need to focus on the clinical and health benefits of some of these evidence-based programs. 
Um, and you know, we have the data to back up what those health outcomes are. Um, if you're talking to the marketing department, um, I think you can talk about how these programs are really um, an added benefit that health plan members, I think, will embrace and want to participate in. And it can set the health plan apart from other health plans. Um, can also help with member retention, as I mentioned. Um, if you're talking to the finance people, you can then talk about the cost savings that some of these programs um, can realize to the healthcare system. Um, and I think falls is a great example. You know, if we can prevent one fall from happening, on average, one fall that has an injury costs the healthcare system $35,000. That's just on average. There's great variation across the country. So if you can use something like that um, you know, to a healthcare system, I think that um, really can show the tremendous value proposition of, of a falls prevention program. Does that help? Yes. Uh, so we have a question here in the back. Um, I'm curious about the information you provided with the mergers and Apple's process of trying to get a unified way to have data and patient information available. Is anybody working so that information in a proprietary system like Apple seems to include um, so it's accessible across the board in various platforms? Yeah, I know at the federal level they're looking at that sort of the interoperability of the systems. That is a huge issue. And I mean, I think Apple has to address that because there are so many different types of IT systems that are used by various healthcare entities across the country. So yeah, that is an issue that's being looked at quite a bit. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, you know, I think Apple's in the early kind of planning stages looking at sort of that, that patient record or that patient portal, so. Just to follow up on that, is anybody looking at possibly creating a universal <laughs> ID card that would allow people to have their information scannable wherever they are in the country? Yeah, I think that's what Apple is looking at okay. as part of their electronic patient record, yes. Oh, okay. We have a question here, Mesa. Okay. So you talked about the um, expansion of Minute Clinics and creating greater access for older adults. One problem with that seems to be greater and greater fragmentation. You know, nobody seems to have the full story about a patient. It's a it's a, especially a problem here because we have a a transient population in terms of they come for seasonal visits and they don't tend to establish mm -hmm. a healthcare provider, use Minute Clinics a lot, and yet those providers don't have a, a full story on a patient. What kinds of things are happening in terms of dealing with fragmentation of healthcare? Because access is great, yeah. but if, if the whole story isn't available and isn't told, then we really have a hard time solving the, the problem. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, it's a huge problem with fragmentation. And I think the sort of like CVS and Aetna merger, merger or the Walmart and Humana merger would help to at least theoretically reduce that fragmentation because those health plans would drive patients to certain health care providers, which would reduce choice. But the health plan would also have all the data on, um, on a particular patient. So there would be you know, a limited number of providers that um, a patient would be able to see under Aetna or Humana. I mean, that's pretty much what Medicare Advantage plans are. So in theory, that would reduce some of that fragmentation. Um, so no matter where they go, if they're up here in the summer and they're in Florida, they would have to see a Humana or Aetna provider down there and be connected to the same um, IT portal through those providers. Yeah, so, but it's, it's a huge issue, I would have to agree. And so this is kind of their attempt at trying to address that through these mergers with this ver vertical merger. We have another question. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, my, my question, um, you talked a little bit about potential kind of development of, you know, different payment models as being potential um, solutions to kind of the health cost of the problem. And I was wondering your opinion on um, 
direct primary care as possibly being like one piece of the puzzle um, as hopefully being you know, a way to help address some of the, the cost savings and having more frequent visits with, um, with physicians for managing some of these chronic disease uh, kind yeah. of solutions? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I think some of the models that I talked about, um, like the independence at home model, and also accountable care organizations, which is another kind of uh, value-based system that better coordinates care, really is a primary care model that's collaborative in scope. So I would absolutely agree that anything we can do to, to enhance primary care for older adults um, and better coordinate care across specialties, maybe using the primary care physician to help do that is, is much needed, yeah. And better coordination leads to hopefully better health outcomes. And with a value-based system, um, a lot of it too is a shared savings approach. So any savings that um, are realized can be shared by those who are part of the model. Um, so it provides incentives to healthcare providers to um, provide better quality care. And a lot of that is around coordination and primary care. Thank you. Elton, any more questions? We've, we've got one here in the back. Or do you have one? In the room here. Any more questions, folks? There don't appear to be. OK. I could ask a question. I heard a lot about Medicare Advantage. And you know, we were talking about the merger with Humana and others and accountable care organizations kind of going that way toward Medicare Advantage. And you know, they're not doing it out of the goodness of their heart. They're, they're doing it because there's money to be made. And uh, that can be waste sometimes. So if you look at the administrative cost of traditional Medicare, it's like 1.4% administrative cost versus some of these others, you're getting up to like 6%, 10%. And they threw up networks, obstacles to people to getting care. Mm -hmm. uh, they call it an advantage because it's not an advantage. Uh, <clears throat> So I have concerns about Medicare Advantage. I heard a lot about it here. I did not hear anything about uh, an improved and expanded Medicare for all. Uh, what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, I, I completely agree. I don't think all Medicare Advantage plans, you know, they're, that they are appropriate for all patients. So, um, you know, part of, too, what we do at NCOA is help people choose the best plans based on their health care profile, their health care needs, their medication needs, and so on. So steering them in the right direction is something that we are definitely attuned to and have focused a lot of attention on those areas. So, but, but I would agree, people with you know, very high cost needs, um, complex needs, Medicare Advantage may not be um, the best approach. But perhaps something like one of these independence at home models could be more appropriate. I think we're still learning about the outcomes of those, but some of the early findings from the demonstration projects did show some, some good results in better coordination of care in addressing those needs, so, which I'd be happy to share. Any other questions? One more on this end. OK. Uh, one of the problems that we know we are dealing with is um, you know, those 10,000 um, folks turning 65 each day and greater and greater diagnosis of Alzheimer's and dementia. I didn't see a lot within your presentation from the NCOA, but could you highlight what might, going on, what might be going on in your agency related to dementia and Alzheimer's? Yeah, that actually is not an area that we do a lot of work in at the moment. There are a number of other national nonprofit organizations that are focused on that, primarily the Alzheimer's Association, but certainly there are a lot of um, national efforts to improve the healthcare system for persons with Alzheimer's, dementia, as well as the caregivers. And I think there are a couple of bills right now um, in Congress to, um, first of all, put more money into research for better uh, treatments and cures for Alzheimer's um, and better coordination of care and finding out you know, what are the best care models for people at different stages of dementia. 
So, so yeah, that's not an area we work in, but I can, I'd be happy to direct you to other areas um, like the Alzheimer's Association. And some of the caregiving organizations have been very, very active in um, ensuring that as healthcare is transformed, that the needs of that very high need population is being addressed. Any other, oh, any other questions on this end? So here from Mesa, I had a similar question, um, but I also didn't see much with the NCOA's efforts and things listed about helping that population with communication because of hearing loss in the aging population. Um, so do you have resources for that or is it dealt with in those individual programs to make sure that people can hear what even is being taught to them or to help yeah. them educate? Yeah. We, um, yeah, we're working with um, some of the program developers and some of the hearing loss organizations to adapt these evidence-based programs for, for that population. So they're, um, I think, a uh, matter of balance. I think Stepping On is working on that currently, and we're helping to disseminate those models for a population with hearing loss. And also educating healthcare providers about you know the special needs of that population and providing resources to to those with hearing loss and their caregivers. Okay, I, I don't think we have any other questions on the Missouri campus, and it's almost one o'clock. Most of our students have departed for class, so <laughs> those that, that are here, let's um, give uh, Kathy a round of applause. Thank you. We really appreciate your time and uh, speaking with the students and spending um, the evening with us last night. We had a great evening. So, Well, thank you for your time and attention. And good luck to all of you as you continue your studies here at AT Still.